Hi everyone, here's the Bookamist once again. How is your summer going to look? Mine is going to look something like this. This is the pile of stuff I have to read and I have more on the way. I reckon that by the end of August I will have managed to shrink it about to more or less that size. I mean, between Pokemon Go, the Steam sales, a man can only do, I mean, up to a certain point. Today I'm reviewing what is by far the book I've been requested to review the most in my very long, very glorious YouTube career. I'm talking about Mason Dixon by Thomas Pynchon. Pynchon's picaresque historical novel about these key figures in American history. And those of you who have watched a few of my videos know that I take notes on the first pages of my books. And uh, with Mason Dixon, this has been the first time I had to add paper to the book with notes on it because I will start scribbling stuff on the like the first page and I will start colliding notes and text and it was getting kind of messy. I don't know if you see anything, but it was getting messy. And say what you will about Mason and Dixon, this is the kind of book that makes you take a lot of notes. Did I like it? Let's, do, let's start talking with, uh, about the language, the language of the book. You probably know this already, if you don't, you should know this before you start reading the book. Mason and Dixon is written in a kind of pastiche style imitation of 18th century language, and especially 18th century literary language. Pinchon wrote it as if he were like an 18th century writer. It is written from the perspective of one of the characters in the novel. The character provides the frame story to the story of Mason and Dixon within. He knew them personally. And this feels very much like reading a very trippy Jonathan Swift, uh, um, uh, Lawrence Stern novel, an 18th century novel of the kind of that literary kind but also at times a like a penny dreadful well not really like a dime novel well not really a gothic novel an early gothic novel those beauties from the late 18th century those pop first instances of popular narratives compelling genre narratives those kinds of things but at the same time, it is also masterfully and wonderfully contemporary. One of the genius things about the language in the book is the way it feels genuine at times. It feels really 18th century, like, in a very masterful way. But at the same time, you find Pynchon's speech patterns and Pynchon proper and, like, specific style and use of words. And sometimes it feels very much like a late 19th book while still being written in this kind of pastiche style that is simply beautiful. Beautiful as it is, the language is still really, really difficult to grasp. Uh, some of the lexicon is really obscure, some of the word uses are really, really cryptic, and especially if you're not a native speaker, it will take you a while to get into the kind of language used by Pynchon. But I have heard also opinions by native speakers proper who were also uh, at a bit of a loss with the book. What I can tell you is that at first you'll find the language wonderfully fascinating, like the first few pages are going to be so beautiful, then it gets a bit hard to get, but once you pass like page 50, page 100, it depends on the reader, you get into that kind of style and you'll start talking like an, 19, well, well, like an 18th century explorer and surveyor yourself. It gets easier as the book progresses. Not only the language, but also the context of the book, the, the reference to scientific discoveries of the time, the references to popular culture and popular figures of the time. They are so, so accurate and so well researched that I once read people, and I, it, it probably was someone in a YouTube comment, um, uh, like with a theory, and this guy believed that Pynchon had actually started writing Mason and Dixon after Gravity's Rainbow in 1973-74, and that it had taken Pynchon about more than 20 years to write the book, because he had researched the period so extensively. I don't think that is a far-fetched theory at all, if you ask me. The book is wonderfully well-researched. The other side of that coin is that it's probably going to be incredibly cryptic, uh, and that unless you are like a professor of 18th century pop culture, unless you are, I think, John Mullen from UCL, this is going to feel, uh, well, a bit disorienting, especially at first. Uh, here, more than in any other Pynchon novel, use the motherfucking sources, use the Pynchon wiki, which is, doesn't really shine with Mason and Dixon, but still, it's useful. Use reader's guides, use essays, I'll put some sources in the description box if you're going to tackle this novel. 
Um, also, because of the way it is written, because of this peculiar language pastiche, this is the one Pincho novel I wouldn't suggest you read in translation. What I mean is, if you're not a native speaker and if you don't read English at all, well, do read it in translation, of course, there's nothing wrong with it, but if you have the chance of reading it in English, if your English is good enough, if you think you can do it, well then do it, because, of course, lots of the language are going to, of the language's nuances are going to get lost in translation. Moving on to what I believe to be by far the novel's greatest strength. I maybe talked about this already, but I believe that Pynchon appeals specifically to two kinds of, of readers. To readers who are so addicted to reading and to stories and to books, to, to reading voraciously that they can't have enough of stories and narratives, and so they want narratives within narratives linked to other narratives in their fiction that create this huge kind of narrative that also starts like conspiracy theories within the book and refers to other theories outside the book. You're so addicted to narratives that you can't get enough and you're looking for narrative overloads, and to people who like to play Western RPGs, and I'm talking about video games, I'm talking about stuff like Baldur's Gate, I'm talking about Neverwinter Nights, um, Dungeons and Dragons kind of stuff. Why is that? Because with those kinds of RPGs, with those kinds of video games, even more recent stuff like Fallout, like Skyrim, like Oblivion, yes, you have the main thread, you have the main quest, you have one story, but then and any place you visit in the video game, you get side stories, you get secondary quests, and you have to get involved in those quests, and often the side quests are more interesting or as interesting as the main quest. That is precisely what happens in Mason and Dixon. Mason and Dixon is the literary equivalent of, I don't know, Neverwinter Nights, or of Baldur's Gate. It is a book with a main thread, but it is a book in which, like, uh, uh, once every two or three chapters you get a digression and you get a, the story of a, a secondary character, you get the story of a character who was just passing by and met Mason and Dixon, and boy are these stories great, boy are they amazing. The story of Stig, the Axeman, the story of the Hollow Hurt, the story of Armand the Chef and his mechanical duck, the story of the Jesuits, um, the story of the were beaver, the story of the giant vegetables, these are all unforgettable. I think, I think they, I like them more than the fucking book. Usually with these kinds of narratives, so many people are put off because you, you'd like to follow the main characters and you don't care about these side characters. But here, as much as the main characters are compelling and you'll, I, I mean, you'll really get, you really become friends with Mason and Dixon by the end of the book they are really compelling character, as much as they are, you get involved and interested in all these wonderful and amazing and inventive and rewarding side stories as they come and as they, I mean, as you read them. This process of accumulation, like, ties in very beautifully with one of the topics of the book, with one of its main issues, which is, which is the value of novels. The book makes a point, I believe, that uh, uh, being an historical book as it is, that novels are a bit of an antidote. I think that a character specifies it in the book. They are an antidote against a specific reading of history as a single story. History, and this is very clear to anybody who studied postmodernism, it should, it being instinctively clear to all, is not a single story, a big story of what happened. It is made of the single individual stories of everyone who lived it, everyone who inhabited it. And reading novels and like taking on the point of view of other people and reading about the lives of other people as far from us as they can be is an antidote against reading history, against reading events as one thing that happened. It helps you take on the point of view of other people, it helps you understand how the world is shaped narratively and especially how history is shaped that way. The book also makes a compelling case for accumulation of this kind and Catherine Hume analyzes this thread very beautifully in her essay on Mason and Dixon, which is featured in the Cambridge Companion to Thomas Pynchon. She says, well, one of the key figures you'll notice yourself in the book is the figure of layers, of things made by layers that, like, create something that is much more than the sum of its parts. This is true, for instance, of the sandwich, which is a key figure in the novel. 
we did this through of like croissants which are made with like strata of dough this is true of some kinds of minerals it's true of very strong iron and metals it is true of books which are like uh, the sum of a lot of pages but become much more than that it is true of political pamphlets it is true of these kinds of things and Mason and Dixon works that way yes you have the main story of Mason and Dixon but you have all these side stories that create this wonderful amazing sandwich in which the two characters are the bread but all the other stories are the amazing stuff in it and really I, I, I trust me this is going to be the best Big Mac you enjoy if not in your life this year probably the book is pushed forward by the quality of its secondary stories by the compelling nature and wonderful characterization of its characters but also by the way it handles its theme and it handles American history and the idea of America in general Pynchon deals with this in a very American literary way he does so in all of his books but here he does so most clearly American literature and most American writers have a weird relationship with America. Not, not weird, but a ambivalent relationship. Because it is clear on the one hand that they love it so much, and on the other hand they are so frustrated because it is so ugly and it's so flawed. This is so clear in Mason and Dixon, which is a novel about how all the things that America could have been and all the things it actually was and it actually became which actually reveals some deep kind of love. I mean, as critical as American literature is of the country and of its history, I believe there is a deep love for it underneath it all. Because, I mean, you get passages in Mason and Dixon where the characters say things like, like they consider slavery in America, and they reflect and they say things like, I mean, America is the one place in which we shouldn't have found slavery. But this very reflection, the idea that America should be different from the rest of the world, from Europe, from Africa, from the rest of the world, already highlights how America, at least subconsciously, is different, is some kind of different land, a land of opportunity where things should, where, where the world should be better than in the rest of the world. The other author who like showcases this ambivalence as good as, as well as Pynchon, as and is as torn as Pynchon on this front, I think, is probably Stephen King. Like King in some of his books, like in Salem's Lot, in books like It, you see how much King like highlights the horrors, the hidden horrors of American society and all that's wrong with it. But at the same time, you understand that there is a deep love for the country and for all it represents underneath all that. It is something very beautiful about American literature, this quality of being critical without hating the place. That I don't think all European literatures have, not in this same way, and that Pynchon showcases beautifully in Mason and Dixon. Which is not an elegy to America, it is not like how cool we are, but it's not even, it's all gross. I mean, you, you see the potential in it. It's like books like Inherent Vice, books like Bleeding Edge 2, they show the same. Against the Day probably is a bit more bitter on that reflection, but that one too showcases the will of the American people and the potential for improvement that's there, even though, of course, Pynchon's point of view is generally a bit pessimist. I was going to talk more about the main characters, about Mason and Dixon. Which one you prefer, by the way, if you read the book? I probably prefer Dixon, but they are both awesome. I was, talking, I was going to talk more about them, but uh, I'll just tell you that at the end of the book, on the last page, I cried like a baby, in a very un-English major-like manner. So let's wrap this up before I start crying again. Do I recommend Mason and Dixon? Does the Easter Bunny bring chocolate eggs? Of course I recommend the book, it's fucking Thomas Pynchon, it's brilliant. Is it a first, a good first Pynchon novel if you've never read the author? I don't think it is, because it's a bit of an exception in Pynchon's canons. Of course it is 100% Pynchonian, but because of the language, because of the way it deals with its themes, it's a bit different from the rest. I don't think it is a good starting point with Pynchon. Also, because I mean, because of all these reasons, I think it's probably the most difficult Pinchon novel I've read after Gravity's Rainbow and after probably The Crying of Lot 49, even though Lot 49 at least is 200 pages long, this one is 800 page. 
is the book flawless? I think it really by very much is, or nearly is, because, I mean, yes, it is 800 pages long, but all of these pages are, are there for a reason. I don't think I could have cut it down even like one or two pages. It's, it's really per perfect on that sense. It achieves everything it wants to achieve. If I wanted to, like to find my inner asshole critic, I couldn't find it. I couldn't find him really. I could tell you that, for instance, to me, the second half, the part, the part in which Mason Dixon are actually in America, is much better than the first part when they are in like uh, South Africa. But I've read the opinion of other people who are certain of the opposite. So really, that's probably just a my opinion, my take on the novel. The book is very much flawless if you ask me. Is it my favorite Pinchon novel? I don't know. I finished reading the book like a few days ago and I need to think about that more. If you ask me right now I'd say that it's probably my third pin favorite Pinchon novel and that I still prefer probably Against the Day and Bleeding Edge to it. But I mean saying that it's my third Pinchon novel is completely pointless unless you are a nerd addicted to charts like I am. It's a great novel and if you're a Pynchon fan, if you're fascinated by the language in it, by the idea behind it, you should definitely read it. It's heart-wrenching, it's beautiful. Thank you so much for watching guys, once again let me know what you thought about Mason and Dixon, let me know if you're going to read it, I've read so many opinions recently of people who just finished it or were reading it and some were in love with it, some found it uh, too difficult to carry on. Do let me know what you think about the novel, even compared to other Pynchon novels, who was your favorite character, what was your favorite side story in it, if I have to pick one I'd probably go with the mechanical duck. Let me know what you think, I will see you in the next one, bye guys! <laughs>